Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 14. And Jesus went out, and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes, in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. These verses begin a chapter full of prophecy, prophecy of which a large portion is unfulfilled prophecy which ought to be deeply interesting to all true Christians. It is a subject to which the Holy Ghost says we do well to take heed. Second Peter chapter 1 All portions of Scripture, like this, ought to be approached with deep humility, an earnest prayer for the teaching of the Spirit. On no point have good men so entirely disagreed as on the interpretation of prophecy. On no point have the prejudices of one class, the dogmatism of a second, and the extravagance of a third, done so much to rob the church of truths which God intended to be a blessing. Well, says Oleshausen, what does not man see, or fail to see, when it serves to establish his own favorite opinions? To understand the drift of the whole chapter, we must carefully keep in view the question which gave rise to our Lord's discourse. On leaving the temple for the last time, the disciples, with the natural feeling of Jews, had called their master's attention to the splendid buildings of which it was composed. To their surprise and amazement, he tells them that the whole was about to be destroyed. These words appear to have sunk deeply into the minds of the disciples. They came to him, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and asked him with evident anxiety, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? In these words we see the clue to the subject of the prophecy now before us. It embraces three points. One, the destruction of Jerusalem. Another, the second personal advent of Christ. And a third, the end of the world. These three points are undoubtedly in some parts of the chapter so entwined together that it is difficult to separate and disentangle them but all these points appear distinctly in the chapter, and without them it cannot be fairly explained. The first fourteen verses of the prophecy are taken up with general lessons of wide range and application. They seem to apply with equal force to the close of both Jewish and Christian dispensations, the one event being strikingly typical of the other. They certainly demand special notice from us, on whom the latter ends of the world are to come. Let us now see what those lessons are. The first general lesson before us is a warning against deception. The very first words of the discourse are, Take heed that no man deceive you. A more needful warning than this cannot be conceived. Satan knows well the value of prophecy, and has ever labored to bring the subject into contempt. How many false Christs and false prophets arose before the destruction of Jerusalem, the works of Josephus abundantly prove. In how many ways the eyes of man are continually blinded in the present day, as to things to come, it might easily be shown. Irvingism and Mormonism have been only too successfully used as arguments for rejecting the whole doctrine of the second advent of Christ. Let us watch and be on our guard. Let no man deceive us as to the leading facts of unfulfilled prophecy, and by telling us they are impossible, or as to the manner in which they will be brought to pass, by telling us it is improbable and contrary to past experience. Let no man deceive us as to the time when unfulfilled prophecies will be accomplished, either by fixing dates on the one hand, or biding us wait for the conversion of the world on the other. On all these points, let the plain meaning of Scripture be our only guide, and not the traditional interpretations of men. Let us not be ashamed to say that we expect a literal fulfillment of unfulfilled prophecy. Let us frankly allow that there are many things we do not understand, but still hold our ground tenaciously, believe much, wait long, and not doubt that all will one day be made clear. Above all, let us remember that the first coming of Messiah, to suffer, was the most improbable event that could have been conceived, and let us not doubt that as he literally came in person to suffer, so he will literally come again in person to reign. The second grand lesson before us is a warning against over-sanguine and extravagant expectations as to things which are to happen before the end comes. It is a warning as deeply important as the preceding one. Happy would it have been for the church if it had not been so much neglected. 
We are not to expect a reign of universal peace, happiness, and prosperity before the end comes. If we do, we shall be greatly deceived. Our Lord bids us look for wars, famines, pestilence, and persecution. It is vain to expect peace until the Prince of Peace returns. Then, and not till then, the swords shall be beaten into plowshares, and nations learn war no more. Then, and not till then, the earth shall bring forth her increase. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4, Psalm 68 verse 6. We are not to expect a time of universal purity of doctrine and practice in the Church of Christ before the end comes. If we do, we shall be greatly mistaken. Our Lord bids us look for the rising of false prophets, the abounding of iniquity, and the waxing cold of the love of many. The truth will never be received by professing Christians, and holiness be the rule among men, until the great head of the church returns, and Satan is bound. Then, and not till then, there will be a glorious church without spot or blemish. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27. We are not to expect that all the world will be converted before the end comes. If we do, we shall be greatly mistaken. The gospel is to be preached in all the world, for witness unto the nations, but we must not think that we shall see it universally believed. It will take out a people, wherever it is faithfully preached, as witnesses to Christ. But the full gathering of the nations shall never take place until Christ comes. Then, and not till then, shall the earth be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Acts chapter 15, verse 14. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Let us lay these things to heart, and remember them well. They are eminently truths for the present times. Let us learn to be moderate in our expectations from any existing machinery in the Church of Christ, and we shall be spared much disappointment. Let us make haste to spread the gospel in the world, for the time is short, not long. The night cometh when no man can work. Troubled times are ahead. Heresies and persecutions may soon weaken and distract the churches. A fierce war of principles may soon convulse the nations. The doors now open to good may soon be shut for ever. Our eyes may yet see the son of Christianity go down like the son of Judaism, in clouds and storms. Above all, let us long for our Lord's return. Oh, for a heart to pray daily. Come, Lord Jesus.